Uh, welcome and thank you for coming to the Koch Institute for our With Insight series. Some of you have been here before. Several others of you are coming for the first time. Um, my name is Tyler Jacks. I'm the director of the Koch Institute. And uh, we hold these events uh, on a regular basis to introduce the work that we do here at MIT and in the Koch Institute in the area of cancer research. Uh, and feature the sort of unique blend of cancer science and cancer-oriented engineering um, that is the hallmark of the research strategy that we've undertaken. I'm hearing a lot of feedback now. Just move. Uh, <laughs> moving over here now. <laughs> so this is a special evening uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, firstly, and as evidenced by the really amazing turnout, uh, we have a terrific featured speaker, and that is my friend and colleague Bob Weinberg, whom I'll introduce in more detail in a moment. Um, but in addition, this is the fifth anniversary uh, of the Koch Institute. We moved into this building just about a year ago, actually, uh, five years ago, actually. Anyway, it being the fifth anniversary of the Koch Institute, this year um, we're using the Within Sight series to feature the five uh, research areas that, uh, that we are pursuing collectively in the Koch Institute. And our most recent event occurred uh, about three weeks ago, and Angie Belcher talked about her work related to uh, cancer monitoring and detection. Uh, we have five research areas. The others include nanotechnology and precision medicine and immunology and, importantly, metastasis. And Bob Weinberg will be telling us about his work related to metastasis in just a few short minutes. In addition, following Bob's presentation and an opportunity for you to ask questions about the science that Bob will present, he and I will be sitting in these two chairs up here having a fireside chat <laughs> without the fire. Uh, but during that discussion, we'll talk about cancer research and, importantly, about Bob's life and his contributions to cancer research, his thoughts about cancer research. And uh, I think it will be a fun and flowing discussion. And it will be also an opportunity for you to contribute. So you might have seen that we had three by five cards out near the registration area. And some of you have already filled out questions for me to look through and to choose among. But if you didn't do that and you want to ask a question, um, I would ask you to put your hand up at some point along the way, whether it's during Bob's talk or during our discussion. And one of our staff will come by and hand you a three by five card. And it'll get passed up to me. And I'll have a chance to read and ask Bob several of those. So please do participate. We're looking forward to an active and engaged and fun evening. Uh, and so without further ado, let me introduce Bob Weinberg, our featured speaker. Uh, Bob is the Ludwig Professor of Biology here at MIT. Uh, his laboratory is in the Whitehead Institute, and he's a founding member of the Whitehead Institute. And before that, he was among the founding faculty of the Center for Cancer Research at MIT. Uh, dating back to 1974, I believe, Bob. So he has a long history here at MIT. Uh, and he is, in, is truly one of the pioneers in cancer research and cancer genetics and cancer biology. Uh, Bob is, is one of the international leaders uh, in the field of cancer research. And we're incredibly privileged to have him on our faculty and to have him here with us this evening. And before I let him up on the stage, I also wanted to point out that it was 60 years ago to this day that young Bob Weinberg celebrated his bar mitzvah. <laughs> and of course, I thought they scheduled this to honor that. So from that, you can begin to do the math and figure that I'm rather long in the tooth. So uh, Tyler and I are just blown away by the turnout this evening. This is really extraordinary. And obviously, we're very grateful for the interest this implies and for your interest in cancer research at MIT, which I have lived through for the last uh, 45 years, I guess, if not 50, whatever. So anyhow, uh, so I, I'm going to talk tonight about a particular topic, the topic of metastasis, which I will try to portray as an important aspect of our understanding of cancer. And here, I just introduce this topic by mentioning the fact that if one looks at all, kind of, all kinds of different human cancers, 
one discovers that they develop through a series of a sequences of steps, starting with fully normal tissue and with the passage of time, a whole series of sequential steps that ultimately, um, that ultimately leads to the formation of aggressive primary tumors and then uh, after that to the formation of the metastases here in the liver, which will be the topic of uh, my conversation with you today. Uh, this is a very long and drawn out process. In the context of the human uh, colon, each of these steps may take 10 or 15 years, or as I often tell the, the uh, freshmen in introductory biology, if they want to accelerate this whole process, they can go to McDonald's every day and maybe they could compress the whole thing down to uh, four or five years per step. Uh, and, uh, but uh, the colon is typical of a whole series of other tissues within uh, the human body in which uh, tumors arise. These tissues are all arising from epithelial cell sheets. So epithelia are sheets of cells. They cover our skin. They line all the ducts in our body. And here we see a whole series of tissues which are uh, heavily representative with epithelial cells and that develop various kinds of different uh, tumors. Because they're all epithelial uh, tissues, they're all called carcinomas as opposed to sarcomas, for example, that arise in um, connective tissues. And here we see once again a depiction of uh, the increasing degrees of abnormality. So one can generalize here. And here in the context of colon cancer, I refer to the work already done at Johns Hopkins in 1989 that described the fact that as cells evolve progressively to higher and higher degrees of abnormality, in this case once again in the colon, one can associate with these different kinds, with the cells in these different kinds of tumors, different distinct mutant genes. In other words, as cells evolve from being fully normal to being highly malignant, they accumulate more and more and more mutant genes within their genomes. Um, and these can be done by molecular biology to demonstrate they're really there. These genes arise as a consequence of somatic mutation. In other words, these mutations were inherited in prist these genes were inherited in pristine form from one's parents. And during the course of tumor formation, in this case in the gut, these kinds of genetic damages occurred within uh, the cells lining the gut. Uh, here we see a similar kind of scheme, this, in this case, in the context of the pancreas. And here, once again, although the uh, illustration is quite different, one notices that as cells evolve progressively to high-grade malignancy, here an invasive carcinoma, one sees once again this accumulation of more and more mutant genes. And importantly for us, these mutant genes are far more than just markers, indicators of having evolved to a high degree of uh, abnormality. In fact, these genes are actually causally responsible for the uh, increasing abnormality of the cells. The more mutant genes, growth-regulating genes these cells accumulate, the more abnormal they behave, doing so under the instruction of these various abnormally functioning genes. Um, now here, uh, we, we just go back to this image and indicate that if we go from the fully normal epithelium lining the gut all the way up to here, we're talking about the formation of a primary carcinoma. And that's always a tumor that begins uh, and is continues to be located at the site where this tumor genesis began, where this tumor formation began. Again, mind you, there could be 30, 40, 50 years that intervene between here and here. But these cells remain where their ancestor uh, originated, that is in the normal epithelium. And by the time one has a primary carcinoma, a tumor of one centimeter in, in diameter may already have a billion cells. All of those billion cells are the descendants of a single cell that began to evolve and spawn many of the descendants that ultimately uh, generate the mass of this primary tumor. But here, I want to focus on this last step, this step of invasion of metastasis. In the case of the colon, as you may know, the colonic cells, when they leave the primary tumor, they invariably disseminate, they move into the liver. And the question is, what goes on here? Over the last 30 years, my colleagues and I have spent uh, lots of effort and, and, and funds and, and sweat equity in trying to understand how the primary tumor is formed. But the process of invasion and metastasis has been more invasive, ev uh, elusive, and, uh, and, uh, and more difficult to understand. But ultimately, it's the most critical aspect of this entire process, 
simply because if one looks at cancer-associated mortality, one sees that about 90% of cancer-associated deaths don't arise from the primary tumor, but rather from the distant colonies, the metastases, that are founded by cells leaving the primary carcinoma and moving into different distant tissues. And one question I will wrestle with this evening that has been central to my own work is the question of whether if one goes from a primary tumor to uh, invasion and metastasis, do cancer cells that reach this point, being pushed toward this, being driven by the accumulation of mutant genes, do they need yet other mutations in order to invade and, or met and metastasize? That's one question one could pose. Or might be, there be other non-genetic mechanisms that make this happen? Here is an artist's depiction of a colon cancer progression. Like virtually all artist depictions, it has virtually no resemblance to what real tissues look like, but we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll overlook that and just make the point that we have increasingly abnormal tissues, uh, normal hyperplasia, dysplasia, in situ cancer. And here we get an invasive cancer that begins to invade through the barrier underlying the epithelium here. And here we see the depiction of its dispatching cells into the circulation. And those cells may thereafter be carried by the circulation to distant tissues throughout the body where they may or they may not found uh, uh, new uh, colonies of cancer cells. And again, we're going to focus on this last step of tumor progression, uh, that is invasion of metastasis. In truth, this last step of tumor progression, which I've referred to repeatedly until now, subsumes a whole series of sub-steps. In other words, when you go from a primary tumor to a distant metastasis over here, one goes through a whole sequence of steps. First, the primary tumor is formed. It invades locally in the site of primary tumor formation. Cancer cells will get into the circulation. They'll be carried by the circulation to distant tissues where they get stuck, where they get trapped. And with some frequency, the cancer cells will escape the blood vessels, invade into the tissue into which they happen to have been carried by the blood circulation. And they may sit there and form what is called a micrometastasis. A micrometastasis being a small cluster of disseminated cancer cells. And in fact, generally, that's the fate of cells that disseminate, that leave the primary tumor, uh, only a minute proportion of these micrometastases, which might be 1, 5, 10, 20 cells, ever succeed in generating macroscopic metastases. And this last step, this conversion here from a micrometastasis to uh, a process of colonization is extraordinarily inefficient, fortunately. So uh, roughly half, women, half of the women who present in the oncology clinic with breast cancer will have thousands of micrometastases in their bone marrow on the day of presentation. But only half of those women will ever develop metastatic disease, testifying to the fact that fortunately, the progression, this last step, is very difficult for cancer cells to succeed in, and, uh, which spares obviously half of these women from uh, confronting the specter of metastatic uh, cancer formation. And this step, last step is termed colonization. I'll dwell on it later. Uh, thank you for that question, um, but I'm on a short time scale here. I, I wanted to repeat the, the When women present in the, in the uh, oncology clinic with a diagnosis of breast cancer, half of those women have metastatic, uh, have micrometastases in their marrow. I'll show you pictures of those momentarily. So here is the question. How are cancer cells clever enough to accomplish all these steps? Because in the end, although we attribute great cleverness to cancer cells and to all kinds of cells in our body, the fact of the matter is cells really are not that inventive. They just carry within the repertoire that they've inherited from the fertilized egg. And this raises the question how they can cobble together all of the various capacities, capabilities that enable them, that empower them to uh, complete all these steps. We know that these are the, some of the end products of metastatic disease. Here we see them lit up by an imaging technique where cancer cells have spread to various sites throughout the body, often obviously compromising vital functions. Here is one gory slide. I thought I'd need to show you at least one of them. Here is the consequence of colon cancer metastasizing to the liver. All of these white colonies, are each of these is a descendant of a, a colon cancer cell that left the, the colon and moved through the portal vein circulation directly into the liver where it founded these metastases.
here's uh, breast cancer metastases on the surface of the brain. And here one can see from both, both of these pictures, one can readily appreciate why metastatic dissemination leading to these metastatic colonies represents a life-threatening conditions. These are not just minor organs in the body. In the earlier stage of uh, invasion metastasis cascade, we see these so-called micrometastases. Here we see a clump of cancer cells, it might, it descendants of a single cell that left the primary tumor and in this case got trapped in a lymph node, in a lymph vessel. And here this is already uh, multiplied into 100 cells perhaps, and it may remain stuck there forever or may eventually disappear. The presence of this growth does not foretell necessarily, as day follows night, the uh, formation of a cancer. Here's yet another kind of micrometastasis. What's interesting here is that the metastatic cells in their shape, in their formation, begin to take on the appearance of milk ducts because these are breast cancer cells. And here they're, interestingly enough, recapitulating the behavior of the cells that form the ducts in the mammary gland although obviously these are not fully normal cells. Surrounding these are, are lymphocytes that one sees in large numbers in a typical uh, lymph duct. And here we can see what, one, what the bone marrow looks like of a woman who may be diagnosed with breast cancer. Because here one can light up the cancer cells, the disseminated cancer cells preferentially. All the rest of the cells out around here are regular blood cells, which can be readily distinguished. And here we see what these micrometastases look like after they've sat in the, in the marrow. In fact, we often diagnose meta micrometastatic disease in the marrow because you can see it's very easy to pick out the cancer cells through specific stains and not have them being obscured by the surrounding uh, normal cells, the blood forming cells that uh, reside normally within the marrow. And here we see yet other ones of these micrometastases and they may persist there for days, weeks, months and eventually disappear or in ways that we still poorly understand. Some of them may one day erupt and, and create clinically detectable relapse. That is to say, the, appear, the clini appearance of clinically um, uh, detectable uh, metastatic disease in a woman who initially bore these micrometastases. And it's difficult to know with any precision whether these metastatic cells will or will not eventually develop into metastatic disease, into relapse. Uh, it's something that still eludes us quite a bit. Here's one line of evidence that suggests that these micrometastases, although they themselves are not necessarily the precursors of macroscopic metastases, they're actually a bit predictive of what will happen to a, a, a cancer patient. Because here, a woman with has, which has, who has very few micrometastases in her bone marrow has pretty good long-term survival whereas those who have micrometastases in their marrow have less long-term survival. You can see it right here. And that indicates that the formation of these micrometastases is indicative of a general trend of cells to be disseminating through her body and landing in the marrow. Those cells themselves may not necessarily be the, uh, the, the harbingers, the, the precursors of metastases, but in fact uh, their presence indicates a general disseminating behavior on the part of the primary tumor. The same thing can be said about uh, colon cancer. Once again, in, in the bone marrow, uh, individuals with micrometastases have a worse prognosis than those that don't have micrometastases in their marrow. So these are various kinds of diagnostic uh, devices one can use to do prognostic, prognosis, that is to say, to predict the subsequent behavior of a patient. Here's yet another stage in the invasion metastasis cascade, which I laid out before. In, in, in greater detail. Here we see still in the context of the primary tumor, these carcinoma cells, they're all here in red. In one of these islands there might be uh, 30 or 40 such cells and they're surrounded by a membrane called the basement membrane. You can see it here highlighted in green. And one talks about cancers like this as being localized, one often says in situ, on site, because they've not moved beyond the site of initial cancer formation. Here one begins to see an ominous trend because here some of the carcinoma cells have eroded and broken, eroded away and broken down the basement membrane that previously confined them into this localized area of, of a tissue and that suggests that they have become more invasive and are able to erode their way through adjacent tissue which again is an ominous trend uh, in the case of a primary tumor. Still, everything I've told you doesn't address the big problem. 
how are cancer cells, or carcinoma cells in this case, clever enough to cobble together all of the traits that enable them to complete the steps of the invasion metastasis cascade. And what I will say this evening is we've learned a lot over the last decade of how they can do so, but there's still some major problems that remain unresolved and, and elude us given our existing experimental tools. So we begin to understand, in fact, I will anticipate what I'm saying momentarily, we begin to understand how cancer cells can do all of these steps. That is at least in our vision, in a hypothetical form. But we don't understand this very last step for reasons I will mention later on. In other words, we now begin to understand how cancer cells figure out how they can move from the primary tumor all the way to a distant tissue. But we can't figure out this last step in which they learn how to make a living in that distant tissue. This remains, as I will say again later, a major puzzle. And the answer or, or the insight on how cancer cells are able to acquire all of these abilities to translocate, to move physically from the primary tumor to a distant tissue, comes from looking at images like this. And this is, here are human uh, breast cancer cells um, growing in a mouse. And here we see actually three kinds of cells. Above this uh, dashed line, these are all cancer cells. And below the dashed line are normal cells coming from the mouse. And in fact, if one looks at a carcinoma, often the bulk of the cells in the tumor are not cancer cells. Instead, the bulk of the cells in the tumor are often called stromal cells, and they are normal cells from the tumor-bearing hosts, or a patient, that have been recruited into the tumor mass because these cells provide the cancer cells with various kinds of support. So these are, they're part of the tumor physically, but in fact, these cells are not necessarily cancerous. They're just lured in there and co-opted by the cancer cells, which exploit them because these cells provide the tumor with various kinds of support, such as, for example, bringing in blood vessels into the tumor mass, which is critical. Here, let's focus for a moment on the cancer cells themselves. That is to say, the cells that are above this dashed line, because we see that they're present in two different flavors, the red flavor and the green flavor. Uh, and um, these flavors, as I will say momentarily, are very uh, critically important because it suggests that these cancer cells can interconvert between two distinct states. Here we see the same image shown around slightly differently. And if we look at this, if we focus on the, the red cells and the green cells, ignoring momentarily the normal stromal cells that have been recruited, what we see is that the red cells behave like epithelial cells. Epithelial cells, as I said before, the cells that form cell sheets, they line various kinds of tubes. They line the stomach, they line the airways, they line the skin. And these are bona fide epithelial cells. So these cancer cells, after they became cancerous, still retained epithelial behavior. They did not forget their origins. They still remained epithelial. And, and you can tell that by the fact that they have expressed a certain protein, which we needn't get into in any detail. The interesting cells here are really the green cells, because these two are, these are also cancer cells, but they shut down all signs of their epithelial origin, and now we call them mesenchymal or mesenchymal. And such mesenchymal cells behave much more like connective tissue cells. In other words, these cells here, these green cells, have shed, have turned their back on the epithelial origin. And even though their genes have not changed, even though their DNA has not changed, they've shifted into an entirely different state of, 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 um, of proliferation. And they've taken on a, a totally different uh, set of attributes. Um, and one says that these cells have undergone an epithelial mesenchymal transition. So that's one phrase you could take home from today. Epithelial <laughs> mesenchymal transition. They started out epithelial, they converted into mesenchymal cells, and we call that in the trade an EMT. And here we see these cells have come from, gone epithelial to a mesenchymal state, and one of these mesenchymal cells you can actually see starting to invade into the adjacent tissue. You can tell that by its shape right here. And here I want to make the point that the red cells are being converted into the green cells without changing the sequence of their DNA. And we know many cells throughout our body can move from one cell type to another. After all, 
all the cells in our body, the normal cells, have the same repertoire of DNA, but they just express different behaviors because they express different genes that they're carrying and don't express others. So here we have this mass conversion, but without changing the sequence of their DNA. Therefore, this is a non-genetic process. It doesn't depend on changing DNA sequence, and often we call such a non-genetic process an epigenetic process, a process that is above and surmounts uh, and transcends genetic changes. And this EMT program uh, was discovered by uh, uh, Elizabeth Hay, Betty Hay, in 1986. She was then uh, at the Harvard Medical School, or as they call themselves, the medical school in Boston, <laughs> much to the uh, distress of all the other medical schools, but we'll, we'll move beyond that. Um, and uh, here, here uh, she, she began to enumerate all the changes that a cell will undergo when it moves from an epithelial state into a mesenchymal state. And here, here, here's a list of them. Among the other changes, they become invasive. I told you about that. They have a different shape. We won't go into the detailed microscopic behavior. And they change all kinds of proteins. And indeed, there's a profound change in their behavior. Now, I will tell you, and this stays within this room, that when my lab started working on the EMT, we got a lot of pushback from the developmental biologists, the embryologists, because being highly territorial, they said, this is our turf. We don't want you, they said, in, in effect, we don't want you working on this. This is not a cancer thing. This is what we work on. And some years ago, I realized I could give them some pushback. And the reason I could give them some pushback is I discovered that the woman who discovered the EMT, Betty Hay, got her education at Smith College out in Southampton. And uh, she was encouraged to go into biology and mentored for six years by Professor S. Merle Rose, who was my sister-in-law's father. <laughs> so I have a hereditary right to work on the EMT. And these embryologists cannot and will not push me around. All right. This is true, by the way. I haven't just made this up for this evening's lecture. It turns out that the EMT is not an invention of human evolution. It's not an, a, a modern invention. It's of extremely ancient lineage. And I give you one evidence of that here. Here's a sea urchin embryo. And we and sea urchins went our separate ways about 550 million years ago, a long time. A wink in the eye of the Lord, but for most of us, a long time. And here we see these cells on the outer part of a, a sea urchin embryo. Here, these are epithelial cells. They're forming a sheet here. And here they become mesenchymal. And these cells are climbing into the center of the embryo in anticipation of their ultimately forming the, in the interior organs of, of the embryo. And in fact, if we look at a whole variety of different forms of animal life um, on this planet, we see that they express various markers of the EMT um, in various stages of development. Indeed, the interconversion of different tissues going from one uh, organ to another organ depends critically during embryogenesis, the development of the embryo, on the transient activation, the turning on and turning off of EMT programs. So this is part of normal development, not just a pathological process like tumor progression. And if you look at the tree of life, and this is only part of the tree of life, and you can't see anything on here, but take my word for it, here we are. We're right here. Our nearest relative on this tree is a duck, I believe. And <laughs> I can tell you that the EMT was already hardwired, developed in the genomes of all of these organisms about 600 million years ago. In fact, if you look at this, the sea anemone, which is almost not an animal, it already has traces of the EMT. And we in the sea anemone probably went our separate ways 600 million years ago. So it's an ancient process that has been highly conserved evolutionarily because it plays a critical role in normal embryonic development. And by implication, it's co-opted opportunistically by cancer cells that reactivate this embryonic program in order to impart, in order to enable them to invade and metastasize. Here's one of the markers of uh, the EMT. It's, uh, it's a gene called SNAIL, and we needn't get into the details of how it works. But suffice it to say that a tumor that expresses high levels of SNAIL has a, a, a uh, much shorter, real, the patient has a much 
shorter relapse-free survival before she redevelops cancer than a woman with breast cancer who has low levels of snail in her tumor. So it's almost predictive of the ultimate evolution of the cancer to a highly aggressive state. It's not just a, a happenstance of the tumor. Among the other um, uh, traits that are conferred on a cancer cell by going through an EMT, we now know what that means, is the following. If a cancer cell goes through an EMT, it can become, it doesn't have to become, but it can become a cancer stem cell. What's a cancer stem cell? Well, here's a hierarchy of cells in, in a tissue. Here's a stem cell. Here are all the more specialized cells in the body. And the stem cell up here at the top of this hierarchy, at the apex, you see it has two arrows coming off of it. One is making more differentiated <coughs> progeny, which lose many of its stem cell attributes. And the, here, the second daughter goes back and becomes just like mom. We call that asymmetric division because the fate of the two daughter cells is quite different. But importantly, this stem cell is self-renewing because of this reflexing error. And the exact same scheme seems to apply to cancers. That is to say, if one looks within a tumor, one sees different classes of tumor cells. This kind of cell, if you pluck it out of a tumor and you put it into a mouse, you may get a new tumor. These cells down here, if you put them into a mouse, they're, they're cancer cells, but they will be incapable of seeding a new tumor. In other words, when cells move from here down to here, they give up the tumor initiating capability. They're still cancer cells and they can still proliferate, but they give up the ability to seed a new tumor. And if you push cells through an EMT, then you often get a in greatly increased number of cancer stem cells. And this also has implications for our conceptualization of how metastases arise. Because if a cell like this, which has tumor initiating capability, moves from the primary tumor to a distant tissue, when it arrives there, it least has qualification to become the founder of a new metastatic colony. Why? Because it has tumor initiating capability. And a metastasis is, after all, just another tumor albeit at a distant site. The rest of the cells in the primary tumor, even though they're still cancer cells, they've given up tumor initiating capability because they've moved out of this stem cell, tumor initiating state. And these cells, even if they were to make the long and tortuous voyage from a primary tumor to a distant tissue, they would not be qualified to become founders of a new metastasis because they've given up their tumor initiating capability. So this represents yet another ominous byproduct of the EMT process. Not only are cells that have gone through an EMT qualified to become more invasive and to disseminate, but when they reach a distant tissue, they at least have the qualifications, not necessarily the guarantee, that they will actually be able to seed a metastatic colony. And again, the process of seeding a metastasis is extremely inefficient. And here I return to this slide. Because we now believe, and we have evidence, and as uh, uh, Senator Joe McCarthy used to say, trust me, I have the evidence here in my hand. <laughs> That's too old for you guys. Anyhow, uh, we now have the evidence that you can go all, if you turn on the EMT in a primary cancer cell, it can do all of these steps just by flipping on the EMT. It can move from the primary tumor all the way to a distant tissue. And, and that represents a, a conceptual revelation because it means that all these steps don't require dozens of new genes to be mutated, doesn't require distinct biochemical mechanisms we have no idea about. All of these things exist under the rubric of the EMT program, this embryonic program that is resurrected by uh, cancer cells and actually during wound healing transiently and of course during embryonic development and is used opportunistically by the cancer cell. So we really have a, an understanding, at least an outline, of how this happens, the physical translocation. And I couldn't have said that 10 years ago, and I wouldn't have because we didn't know much about it. This, however, is the, la the, the, the abiding puzzle. What happens after cancer cells with very low efficiency seed micrometastases, how do they ever succeed in making a living in a distant tissue?
I again emphasize this is an extraordinarily inefficient process. Maybe one in a million cells succeeds in make, growing from a micrometastasis to a macroscopic metastasis. And here I just give you a, a schematic indication of the way in which cancer cells actually metastasize. Prostate cancer cells, looking at the thickness of the arrow, preferentially metastasize to the bone marrow, as do, by the way, breast, breast cancer cells. Pancreatic cells will preferentially metastasize to the liver, um, as will, by the way, colon cells. Uh, breast cells will also metastasize to the brain. And we don't really understand why they have these preferential meta metastatic patterns. But what's uh, elusive here is the following question. What determines whether a cancer cell that leaves, for example, the prostate will be able to make a living in the brain or the lungs or the liver and the bone? Each of those different tissues represents foreign territory. And so when a prostate cancer cell arrives in the liver, how is it supposed to make a living? Because it's surrounded by a very unfamiliar and potentially inhospitable tissue. Cancer cell, normal cells, and even cancer cells are used to dwelling in one kind of tissue and very uncomfortable if they're transplanted into a foreign tissue. And therefore, the big barrier to their forming uh, metastases here is trying to figure out how they can adapt themselves to living in a foreign and potentially hostile environment, in this case, the tissue to which they've been carried by the circulation. And again, fortunately, they have a very hard time cobbling together these adaptive programs. But we don't understand how these adaptive programs work. We're only beginning to understand that. It still remains very elusive. It could be very complicated. And uh, I, I'm even wary of having people in my lab work on the problem of this adaptation because it could represent uh, years of work, decades of work, in trying to understand how this actually happens. So again, uh, the last step here involves all this adaptation, which is, again, for cancer patients, extraordinarily inefficient. It occurs only very infrequently. But obviously, we must learn what it is that cancer cells do in order to successfully colonize a distant tissue. And so I think on that note, I will bid you adieu. Uh, well, not really. I, I won't, I'm not about to check out. But uh, uh, Tyler and I will sit up on the podium, and we will chat, or as he would say, we'll schmooze a little bit. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Bob. Let's give him a round of applause. Well, Bob, that was outstanding. Uh, I can see already that we are collecting questions for you, which is wonderful. I'll, I'll get us started, if that's all right. Uh, let me actually first start by mentioning my history with the man to my right. In the interest of full disclosure. In the interest of full disclosure, I am a cancer researcher today because of him. That's a fact. Uh, when I was a junior in college, I was taking a cancer class up the river. Harvard. And uh, it was a seminar style class where they brought in speakers from Harvard and elsewhere. And one day, they brought in a speaker from down the river at MIT. The trade uh, school. That was in 1980. <laughs> that was in 1982. And Bob described work that he was doing at that time, which resulted in the cloning of the first human cancer gene. It was an amazing breakthrough in cancer research. And it really set the stage for what is now the current era of molecular oncology. And I was incredibly captivated and motivated and made the decision roughly that day that that's what I wanted to do in my life. So I owe it all to him. Uh, <laughs> I went off to graduate school and did cancer research. And then to do my postdoctoral studies, which we do in our field, I came back and worked in his lab as a postdoc. And then decided to stay at MIT on the faculty in part to maintain my collegial relationship with Bob Weinberg. And so I owe a lot to Bob Weinberg. And, uh, and in part because when he was applying for a faculty position, I said at the time, he was just a postdoc, this guy is going to be a future leader of our community. Sometimes he's wrong. So anyway. <laughs> this is true. So Bob, I wanted to talk about many things. We don't have too much time, but I wanted to sort of talk about science and, and a little bit of life as well. Uh, let's start with the science. Um, you would just described beautifully the metastatic cascade. Uh, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a scary proposition 
that uh, cancer cells have the plasticity that they do, that they can change so dramatically from epithelial to mesenchymal. Uh, they can take up shop in other parts of the body. And this would seem, and I know it does, represent a very difficult clinical challenge. Cancer patient presents with disseminated disease. What do you do about it? So if you could talk about the implications of our understanding of metastasis from the point of view of treatment. Well, people uh, say to me when I give this talk, uh, that's all well and good, uh, how very interesting conceptually it is that you know all these things now. But in the end, what are you going to do for my mother-in-law who just has metastatic uh, lung cancer? And, and here's the problem. And I don't have any ready, f facile answer, but here's the problem. Some people say, well, why don't you just prevent metastasis from happening in the first place? Then we wouldn't have to deal with all these metastases. But the real problem is that often by the time you diagnose a primary tumor, the cow is already out of the barn. The cancer cells have already disseminated from the primary tumor to distant tissues. They may not be detectable there yet, but they're already there, and trying to block their migration is a fool's errand because it's already historical. Therefore, the only possibility for, for treating metastases, which I think is, an actually very, is a very attractive one, is to assume, very reasonably, that the cancer cells forming the metastasis are actually quite similar to the cancer cells in the primary tumor, and that to the extent we will have truly effective ways of eliminating primary tumor cells, that will confer also therapeutic benefit in getting rid of metastases. Indeed, it seems to me obvious that many of the successful cancer therapies we have today are successful because not only do they eliminate cells in the primary tumor, but they also eradicate disseminated cells at distant tissues. We can't always observe that because the disseminated deposits of cells in, different tissue, in distant tissues may be below our level of detection. But we seem to be able to get rid of them with many conventional therapies and ever increasingly with more modern therapies that are directed toward the molecular uh, agents that are misbehaving inside cancer cells. So let me, let me push you a little further in that direction. Uh, you mentioned the connection between uh, the EMT and the development of stem-like cells in cancer. One of the properties of stem-like cells is their ability to resist treatment. And so there's been some work, and you started a company called Veristem that's in this space of trying to find treatments that would specifically eliminate the cancer stem cells. So if you could expand on that and the importance of that. So one, one uh, trait of cells that have gone through the EMT and may become cancer stem cells is the following. The products, the cellular products of the EMT are often six, eight, tenfold more resistant to chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And therefore, what happens when you treat a tumor is often the tumor shrinks down to almost nothing. There's almost no residual disease left. The, the oncologists declare victory, as I often say incorrectly, like presi American presidents standing on the decks of aircraft carriers, but I digress. Uh, the oncologist declares victory, but the residual cells that are left behind are gifted with the ability to generate new tumors. And so these cancer stem cells really represent insidious threats. And one can make arguments to argue, uh, to prove that if one really hopes for durable clinical treatments, and when I say durable, I mean that the patient not only resolves over a period of weeks and months, but has a healthy life for 5, 10, 15 years, those durable responses, in my opinion, involve eliminating both the bulk of the cells in the tumor, which we kind of are able to do now, but also eliminating, independent of that, the small subpopulations of these more aggressive cancer stem cells. I believe failing to do both, one will uh, inevitably uh, confront the specter of having uh, relapse. Hmm. So I have a question from the audience, which uh, stays on this EMT theme. It's a very uh, well-framed well, uh, question has to do with the fact that uh, you describe the importance of the EMT in taking carcinoma cells into this mesenchymal state where they disseminate. Does it follow, therefore, that when they get to where they're going, they reverse the process and undergo an MET? That's a very good question. You thought of that? I didn't. It came in from the audience somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, what happens is that when the cancer stem cell goes to a distant tissue, 
it does something interesting. It makes more cancer stem cells in the resulting metastasis, but many of those cells go through a mesenchymal epithelial transition, the exact opposite, and generate non-stem cells. So that if one wants to have a robustly growing metastatic colony, one needs a mixture of a minority of cancer stem cells in the metastatic colony, together with a majority of non-stem cells that have been spawned by the cancer cell that took up residence there initially. So the same kind of hier hierarchical uh, organization that I showed you before that operates in the primary tumor also operates in the metastatic colony, which begins to encourage one to think that maybe the biology of metastases is not so different from the biology of the primary tumor that previously spawned them. Yeah. So I have another question from the audience. You alluded to the um, interesting fact that cancers often seed metastases in stereotypical sites. You ended with that description. You didn't talk about much of what we know, and we don't know very much, but the question has to do with what sort of methods are being used, and specifically what sort of screens are being used to try to identify the genes or the programs that allow cells to move to particular places in the body. This turns out to be a very challenging uh, a problem. One thing I kind of slipped over was that we know a little bit about why cancer cells form metastases in certain sites. The reason why colon cancer cells tend to form uh, metastases in the liver is that they get evacuated from the colon directly into the liver by the portal circulation. That's kind of a plumbing issue. But it doesn't deal with how cancer cells adapt to different tissue and microenvironments. And people are trying to figure out the complex gene expression programs that enable a cell from one tissue of origin to adapt to a different tissue, and there's large amounts of uh, data being accumulated, and to my mind, one gets some occasional interesting insights, but the insights we've gotten to date, in my opinion, represent only 1% of what we need to know and what we will know a decade from now. So I'm gonna ask a few more science questions, and then we're gonna shift over to Bob's life and, and embarrassing him if, as best we can. Uh, Take great pleasure in Yes, exactly. So the, I want to turn a little bit towards therapy. We touched on it already. There's a question from the audience specifically about the immune system and, and how the immune system might protect against metastasis. And if you could expand on that to talk about the role of the immune system in, you, in treatment of cancer today. Well, when I was growing up, when I was still young and good looking, well, <laughs> when I was still young. Anyhow, <laughs> uh, for me, as a cancer biologist, it, 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 uh, immune, uh, tumor immunology was all snake oil. It was all smoke and mirrors. It was, it was, it was such a uh, disreputable field of research that no one I knew who had, could hold his or her head high would go into that field because there was much promise and absolutely no delivery because there was no indication, solid scientific indication, that the immune system could actually defend us against cancer cells the way it clearly defends us against being overwhelmed by the thousands of infections that we get during a human lifetime. But over the last decade, there is now very solid and convincing evidence that the immune system is also involved in defending us against cancer. And the reason why the immune system does not succeed time after time in eliminating, in eradicating cancer cells is not that it can't recognize the cancer cells as foreign bodies, but that the cancer cells uh, cobble together what are called immunoevasive maneuvers. The cancer cells send out signals to either kill the immune cells that approach them or inactivate the immune cells. So the cancer cells develop all kinds of ways of defending themselves against immune attack. And now over the last five years, some researchers have finally found ways by which one can break down the defenses that the cancer cells use to defend themselves against these various attacks by the immune system. And that's led to some truly remarkable uh, responses by activating, by unharnessing the, uh, the powers of, of the immune system. But to date, those, uh, uh, those observations have largely been confined to, let's say, melanomas. But the evidence is solid that the immune system is on watch. And if we could only begin to figure out how the immune system uh, protects us against solid tumors, we haven't really got there yet, that would really represent a true revolution. Mind you, I'm saying this as someone who was skeptical for probably a quarter of a century in the disreputable field <laughs> of tumor immunology. 
There is, in fact, tremendous excitement. And in the Coke, we're doing a lot of work related to stimulating the immune response against cancer, including against solid cancers. And I think we as a field are just incredibly excited about the potential of this form of therapy. So I now want to switch gears, Bob, if I may, talk about you and, and uh, get a little personal. So uh, Bob, Bob Weinberg, as I alluded to before, had his bar mitzvah in 1955. November 19th, 1955, <laughs> let's be precise. And 13 years before, in 1942, he was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And uh, remarkably enough, in the very same nursery where he was just a newborn, sitting nearby, or lying nearby, I guess, uh, was a young baby called Frank Solomon, who happens to also be on our faculty and works in this building. And in that same school system. We may be changelings. You may be changelings. <laughs> there was uh, a young man by the name of Jim Haber, who's a professor at Brandeis University. And a year or two before, there was a young man named Steve Lippard, who's a professor here in chemistry. Uh, and George Corey was part of your uh, neighborhood as well. S same so, elementary school. Same elementary school. So the question I have for you, and I want you to expand into the importance of STEM education is, what was in the water in Pittsburgh? <laughs> well, uh, I and these other people whom you mentioned were the beneficiaries of really what was an excellent public education system. When I was growing up in Pittsburgh, really there were teachers who were dedicated to teaching us and never after I left the Pittsburgh public schools did I have the quality of education that uh, I, uh, I enjoyed there. And to the extent that I can do things today, I attribute a lot of that to the education I got in elementary school and high school. It's really important. Uh, when I was here in college, I went to MIT as an undergraduate because friends of my parents had sent their sons to MIT. What did they know about college? Uh, I had uh, a whole mixed bag of, uh, of, of education in introductory biology. We call it 701 here at MIT. I had uh, instruction by a professor who remained unknown, unnamed that was so abysmal that I got a D in the course. <laughs> and today, when I teach the course, Tyler taught it for a while. My first lecture, I say, class, I have a confession to make. When I took this course in 1961, I got a D, and the students are all very excited. <laughs> so teaching quality is very important. And I just would like to say that at MIT, unlike other universities in the world, no names mentioned, all the faculty actually teach. I talk to people who say, you mean they have the senior professors teach? That's part of the job here. We, we regard it as a higher calling rather than as, as an obligation that I have to teach. And I often tell graduate students when I visit them across the world, if you ever want to learn how to describe your science well, the only way you can do it is to teach. I couldn't agree with you more, actually. It's a great quality of MIT. I happen to teach MIT undergraduates this morning in a course we have here on cancer. And I talked about metastasis. And I took a lot of those slides from your book, as a matter oh, of fact. Oh, every copy counts. <laughs> so as Bob alluded to, he, uh, he came from Pittsburgh to MIT at the age of 18. Uh, later that year, Stan and Barbara Jacks welcomed their youngest son to the world. Uh, and you said already that you took 701. I know from whom he took the course. We don't and, mention. And I actually asked him once why Bob got a D, and he blamed Bob, not himself, I must say. So Bob then went off to graduate school, and he was adventurous. He did his graduate studies at MIT. In the interest, <laughs> in the interest of full disclosure, the only graduate school I could get into was MIT, because my written academic record was so poor that they took me here on the basis of what's called personal recognizance or something. <laughs> this is true. So Bob then did his postdoctoral studies. He spent about 20 minutes at the Salk Institute and then was recruited back to MIT to the faculty in the Center for Cancer Research in 1974. And he's been here ever since. So he's really an MIT lifer. A stick in the mud. You are a stick in the mud. Now, you already mentioned one of the things you like about the place, namely the senior faculty teach. And teaching is important to us here. But what else has kept you here? Why the loyalty? Well. The fact is, you think you can do science in a vacuum, but it ain't so. Uh, the way that really good science gets done, in my opinion, since you've asked, 
is to exist in a, in a culture. It takes a village, to quote uh, Hillary Clinton or whoever. It takes, it takes a community. It takes colleagues whom you actually like to be with. It takes colleagues who are not overly self-important, not prima donnas. It takes colleagues whom you like to talk to all the time. And importantly, it takes students who not only talk with you, but talk to students from other laboratories as well. So what has been so extraordinary for me at MIT is not just the quality of the students and the postdocs whom we can recruit, but to exist in this community. Imagine here, within 100 yards of this place, there's the Coke, there's the Whitehead, there's the Broad, there's the main biology department. And you think, well, physical location doesn't make any difference, but it does. And so all our students are mixed together all the time. And to the extent that there are really innovative, interesting ideas that come up, for example, in my own lab, most of them have come up from the minds of the students, not my own. And most of their ideas have come from talking with their other students. So a community is extraordinarily important. The sociology of science is not simply a minor factor in whether one has high or low quality science. Science is done as a communal enterprise. And, and what I fear most about retirement, which will have to come uh, <laughs> one day, some people say never, but I am more realistic, uh, is uh, the loneliness, the isolation. Because ultimately, research is a social activity. One spends all day talking with people, not just cooped up in an office reading boring research journals. <laughs> so Bob, you've seen cancer research evolve on this campus since its origins in the Center for Cancer Research. You and David Baltimore and others spun out the Whitehead Institute, continued to do great cancer research there. Along came the Koch Institute in its own style. So if you could reflect on that sort of changing face of cancer research over the last, I guess, 41 years on this campus. In 1970, David Baltimore and Howard Temin discovered an enzyme called reverse transcriptase and uh, uh, a, a retroviruses. Uh, they understood how retroviruses proliferate and that they could create tumors in animals. And so it was all the rage that year that human cancers are actually created by the retroviruses that Balt uh, Temin and Baltimore had allegedly discovered, although they'd been known far earlier. And so the American Congress under President Nixon introduced the National Cancer Act. It was in 70 or 71. And all of a sudden, there was wads of money to, to study cancer. Uh, now, the, the fact of the matter is Salvador Luria, who was a bacterial uh, geneticist, was here on campus, and he said, this is an opportunity. We'll start a cancer center here at MIT. In truth, he didn't actually know that much about cancer, but he got the money, and it was not a comprehensive cancer center with clinical facilities. It was a pure research center, which was the first of its kind in the country. And he recruited a lot of good people, more than good people, uh, and I could name them, but of course, if you name some names, leave out others, so I won't even go that far. <laughs> now, the fact of the matter is, in 1972, there was not that much to do about studying the molecular basis of cancer. We really didn't know anything. And so most of the people who were recruited to the MIT Cancer Center, they were excellent scientists. But if truth be told, entre nous, again, this stays in this room, they didn't work on cancer at all. I was almost the only one working on cancer among 15 faculty members. But it didn't matter. Because in Luria's mind and in Baltimore's mind, the molecular biology and the cell biology that was being worked on by my other colleagues would eventually come home to roost in terms of understanding how cancer cells behaved. And it turned out to be correct. So for much of the early years of the MIT Cancer Center in, in the old candy factory across the street, uh, were, were all kinds of very interesting cell and molecular biology and biochemistry experiments undertaken that proved to be a fertile breeding ground for our rapid elucidation of what cancer cells really were in the 1980s. So it wasn't just an empty promise that allow us to study DNA molecular biology and we'll tell you something about cancer. It turned out to be fulfilled. And importantly, sometimes people in other fields of research grumble that the cancer researchers are getting the, sh the lion's share of the money. Some of them say snidely, more people are living off the disease than dying from it. <laughs> but we won't take that one. The truth of the matter is that the products of cancer research over the last 30 years, 40, almost 40 years, have totally enriched the fields of immunology, neurobiology, 
uh, um, uh, all kinds of biochemistry, all, all kinds of different human uh, disease conditions. They base much of their research on the lessons that my friends and I developed. And when I talk about friends, I talk about the large community of cancer researchers developed in the 1980s to study the molecular biology of cancer cells. Because after all, cancer cells are pretty much like normal cells, and the lessons we learned proved to be invaluable for all kinds of different fields of studying human pathology. Among those uh, early faculty was Phil Sharp. Yes. Won the Nobel Prize for his discovery of RNA splicing. Another example, which was born from cancer cells, but had a huge impact on normal cells. Yes. Uh, so, Bob, your career has been truly remarkable, and I'm not just saying that because you're sitting next to me, but it's uh, spanned. Maybe in small part. Spanned <laughs> the uh, huge developments in the fields of cancer research, from the cloning of the first oncogene to the cloning of the first tumor suppressor gene to working out important components of the tumor microenvironment, to your great work on metastasis. How do you, how do you pick what to work on? How do you know where to go? What sets the path for you? Personally? Yeah. Well, I gave you one clue uh, uh, this evening because I tell people in my lab, I don't want you to work on how cancer cells from one tissue of or origin adapt to grow in another tissue of origin. Is it an important question? Absolutely. But I find, I fear that it's going to be incredibly uh, challenging to figure that one out. And I don't want people in my laboratory to spend six, eight, or 10 years on their PhD thesis. So one thing you have to do is to exert some taste. What problems can you attack successfully in a reasonable short period of time? Indeed, I tell uh, my students, the most difficult thing to figure out as you're trained to be a researcher is develop a taste for problems that you can actually work on that are conceptually important, but in principle are solvable. Uh, that's, uh, so one has to continually be obsessing. Is this a problem th that, is, uh, that is solvable in a reasonable period of time? There's lots of people, and again, no names mentioned, who think that gathering all kinds of data for its own sake is a great thing. And right now, uh, the young graduate students can gather measurements at a rate 10,000 times higher than I could when I was a graduate student, 10,000 times higher. The problem is we are now overwhelmed with tsunami waves of data, measurements of everything, of genes and this and that, and we don't really know how to digest all this information in order to extract some useful conceptual take-home lessons. So that's one of our current uh, difficulties. We have far more data and far more observations that we can really distill into small numbers of concepts. And that's a challenge for the future. Mm. Right now, the bioinformaticians say, well, just give us all this data and we'll crank it out into some kind of computer and we'll give you the, uh, the interpretation. It's just a matter of, it's trivial, they will say. <laughs> well, when you shake hands with such people, remember to count your fingers afterwards. <laughs> uh, that again stays in this room. <laughs> So I have a question here, Bob. We'll just spend a few more minutes, but I have, I have a question. It's not really a, a request. It says, um, tell an embarrassing story about Bob. It says here. This is not what I signed up for today. But I'm going to take this opportunity anyway. We're amongst uh, 250 of our favorite friends. So I mentioned to you that I was a postdoc in Bob's lab. This is back in 1988. And um, earlier in 1988, I interviewed with him and during that interview, I described the project that I wanted to work on, which was to construct a mouse model of retinoblastoma using a newly described method of gene targeting in embryonic stem cells of the mouse. It hadn't been done before. I thought it might be able to work. And if it did, it would be a great thing. And so I described this to Bob, and he smiled, and he nodded, and he said, that sounds wonderful. I then went back to graduate school and told my PhD advisor how it had gone. And the next week, my PhD advisor had a phone call with Bob, where Bob shared with him that he thought the project that I had proposed had as much chance of working as a fart in the wind. <laughs> Would I ever use such words? <laughs> well, it was challenging. You did it in the end. Uh, it was a brilliant success. 
It was a lot of sweat that you put into it, but you made it work, and it turned out to have been profoundly important. But here's, you have to always exert a taste. Uh, I was expressing my taste at the time, and people who are afraid to express their taste and to impose their taste on scientific issues end up, I fear, wandering off in, in, in all kinds of unproductive directions. One has to be constantly winnowing all the ideas to figure out which ones are gonna lead somewhere and which ones are unattainable. And I happen to have made a misjudgment there <laughs> because three years later, you made it work. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna close with one other observation about Bob and let him talk about it a little bit. In addition to the fact that he's a wonderful colleague and a wonderful teacher, as you could see tonight, and a phenomenally important researcher in the field, he is also a prolific author. These are books written by Bob, uh, including the textbook that he drew those slides from tonight. Very, very beautiful textbook. But also many books for the popular uh, reader, for the, for the lay audience. And I know you spend a tremendous amount of your time on these projects, and Bob's wife Amy can attest to that, I think. So why do you do it? What, what motivates you to put in so much effort to describe what we do to a more general audience? Well, I've been thinking about that, just not because of this question, but um, I realized when my grandfather uh, died in 1974, he'd been born in 1879. When he was young in Germany, he knew old women who, when they were young, tore up bed sheets to make bandages for Napoleonic soldiers, uh, to make bandages for the soldiers. And I realized when he died, everything that was in his brain just evaporated in a matter of four or five minutes. And so, and, and I come from a family of refugees from Europe, and I realized that telling people what you know and getting it down on paper is very important because if you don't, maybe it too will go evaporate. Maybe it too will, it will be lost for posterity. And so I've always thought it's kind of important to tell people what kind of wisdom you have. They can dismiss it or they can integrate it into their thinking. But it's good to kind of memorialize what your thinking is. In, some people might find it helpful. Others people might find it distressful. Other people, many, might find it rather tedious. But at least you've given it a try. Well, I think, speaking for all of us, uh, we don't just find it helpful. We find it also inspirational. So thank you so much, Bob Weinberg.